Before we get started, a content warning for listeners. We talk about eating disorders in this episode. Please take care while listening. In late 2021, former Facebook employee Frances Haugen shocked the world when she leaked internal research about Instagram, the social media app that Facebook, since rebranded as Meta, owns. My name is Frances Haugen. I joined Facebook because I think Facebook has the potential to bring out the best in us. But I'm here today because I believe Facebook's products harm children, stoke division, and weaken our democracy. The leaks exposed internal knowledge that the app had the potential to affect the mental health of young users. Countless conversations on this subject have happened in the time since. Decision makers at Facebook were summoned before the American Senate. We're here today because Facebook has shown us, once again, that it is incapable of holding itself accountable. And lawmakers grilled them on why they hadn't acted on that knowledge to protect kids on their app. A foremost concern was Instagram's effect on young girls and their body image. This episode, we're talking about the power of visual platforms like Instagram, TikTok, and Snapchat on teen mental health. These platforms have become embedded in the lives of teenagers. They've changed the way teens interact with each other and the world around them. But the more researchers look into mental health and social media use, the less black and white the issue seems to be. What do we really know about the effect of social media on teens? I'm Taylor Owen, an academic who studies technology and who is very glad social media didn't exist when I was in high school. I'm Nicole Edwards, a journalist who's definitely guilty of flexing for the gram. This is Screen Time. There are huge questions playing out right now over the place of technology in our lives. Facebook was scheming to bring even younger users into their field. You're basically giving out your personal ID to games so they can make money for it. There are some people that I would like to block in real life. We could work together, but I will add that there are tensions because in the app market, their job is to sell, sell, sell. There's a lot that like, I just don't understand. This is their platform, this is their life. Where's the limit? Every parent is struggling with these questions. Governments around the world are trying to keep up, and the scale and pace of change is only increasing. In this show, we'll talk to parents and kids about how they navigate the digital world. And to the researchers and policymakers who can help us understand the consequences. I'm going to introduce you to a teen who's seen both sides of social media the positive side, and the side that's outright dangerous. While adults debate how to protect kids on social media in court, this 17-year-old has been cultivating a safe space online for girls grappling with mental illness, especially the girls that research shows are more susceptible to harm because of how these spaces are constructed. Hi, my name's Millie, and I suffer from anorexia. And... About a year ago now, I started documenting my recovery journey on social media. Like a lot of us, Millie started to feel her mental health decline as the pandemic dragged on. I think everyone was spending a lot more time kind of just in their own head and really made me think about some things that made me realize that my relationship with food maybe wasn't what would be considered normal. I found Millie's profile through the Mental Health Matters hashtag on TikTok. Millie also posts to Instagram and YouTube. Her content is part autobiography, part self-care resource for other young people with eating disorders. There are videos where she's eating her fear foods, which are foods that cause feelings of guilt or shame in someone with disordered eating. Other posts show Millie in a medical gown while she's getting help at a hospital. In her Instagram bio, it says, welcome to my safe space. She carefully emphasizes how different every recovery journey can be, reminding followers that their journey to better health might not look like hers. When I asked Millie to explain her content, this is what she said. I would probably describe it as trying to raise awareness for the mental health issues that I'm struggling with and to be like a person that people who are struggling with those mental health issues, they can like relate to because it can be quite lonely when you're struggling. 
Millie joined social media younger than she was technically supposed to, but Common Sense Media reports that this isn't unusual. Over half of North American kids get social media accounts before they're allowed at age 13. It can be hard for young people, as they suddenly enter a space designed for adults, to identify content that's harmful. And if they show interest in harmful content, like posts that promote unhealthy eating, for example, Instagram's algorithm can show them more of that same content instead of shielding them from it. This was part of the problem that Frances Haugen, the whistleblower, identified in her 2021 testimony. Facebook knows that its amplification algorithms, things like engagement-based ranking on Instagram, can lead children from very innocuous topics like healthy recipes to anorexia promoting content over a very short period of time. Millie says this sounds familiar. I would say that is definitely how I probably got sucked into the world of kind of disordered behaviors through innocently searching how to be healthy, things like that. It can very quickly take you into what is actually the opposite of health. How old were you when you first got Instagram? Probably around the age of 12. Yeah. How old were you when you were able to better identify positive and negative content? Honestly, probably not until I turned 15, which is really like scary to think about. Like the first three years that I spent on Instagram, I was totally unaware of the, like, the negative things that I was viewing because I hadn't been told otherwise. Yeah. I think once I started recovering from anorexia, I learned a lot about what health actually looks like. And I think that's when I caught on to the fact that maybe not everything I was seeing on social media was actually promoting healthy lifestyles, even if they claim to be. So I think it is really important that young girls get taught about what is actually healthy rather than what Instagram deems to be healthy. It's heartening that Millie channeled her experience into building something positive online. Yeah, and her story really shows powerfully how these tools can be both harmful and be also used to address those harms. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine how hard it is growing up inside social media, inside a performative space, inside a space driven by recommendation engines and the potential to go viral and the constant comparisons with others. And I want to add that we're zooming in on girls here, but these challenges are faced by all teenagers on social media. But girls have become a central part of this conversation because they use social media at higher rates and because research has shown that unfortunately they're more prone to depression at this age. These two things make them more susceptible to having difficult experiences on social media platforms. With all that in the background, girls are joining social media at a critical stage in the development of their identity. And they're spending a lot of time in these aesthetically driven visual mediums. In the early days of platforms like Instagram, the trend was to strive for clean, curated, and frankly, unrealistic depictions of daily life. A lot of people's social media feeds were what they now call highlight reels, meaning they only showed exciting things, like taking an awesome vacation. Yeah, and you probably wouldn't see a picture of that same person during a flight delay. You'd just see them smiling from the beach. Exactly. Teens are now breaking that early mold. Kids like Millie are posting about their personal challenges, and there's another trend that's a perfect example of how young people on social media are navigating this pressure to appear perfect. Finstas. Right. Finstas is short for fake Instas, as in a fake Instagram account. I talked to a 14-year-old named Sienna about this. She lives in Toronto with her mom, Ruth, who you'll also hear. And Sienna doesn't have a Finsta herself, but she's definitely familiar with them. Yeah, yeah, some of my friends have that. It's usually like something for just the people you're close to, so you make the account private, and then it's like a sneak peek of your life outside the little, perfect little picture of your main social media account. And why do you think that people feel like they need to make a second account to do that? Social media is like, you look perfect, you have to look perfect in every picture. Your caption needs to be perfect. And then your fence says just for you to be yourself, kind of. 
The fact that we call these accounts where people are being themselves their fake Instagram accounts shows how mixed up what's real and what's not can sometimes be on social media. Yeah, and I can see how something like a Finsta would make a young person feel a little safer from being judged by followers because of that. Exactly. It's a coping strategy for some people. Both Millie and Sienna have had to figure out how to use social media in a way that allows them to be themselves. For Sienna, that took some experimenting. Do you use any filters? Not really. I used to when I was like younger, like when I first got Snapchat, when I was like 11, 12, but not anymore. I don't like filters. <laughs> Why don't you like them anymore? They make me look different than how I actually look. And I don't want to deceive people. <laughs> I imagine some parents might hear all of this and think, well, maybe kids shouldn't have apps like Instagram or TikTok at all. But it can be really hard for adults to grasp just how important social media is to kids because they didn't live through that themselves. And they don't see the type of interaction that kids are having in these spaces. And at the same time, teens at this stage are becoming more independent and do need more privacy. But of course, they still need parental support, so there's a real tension here. Yeah, and that dynamic also makes it hard for parents to separate good and bad influences when it comes to what their kids are looking at on social media. So if they notice a behavioral change, it can be difficult to trace the source. That's what scares Sienna's mom, Ruth, the most. I don't think there's anything that can, you know, in an organic way, allow you to see what interests your child and, and, you know, see social media through her eyes. I wish I could see what she's looking at every time. She can not post at all and still be changing internally with all the influence that social media has. So Taylor, our question for you to explore with experts sounds simple, but as we just heard, it's far from it. With all the actors in this space, marketing companies, influencers, peers, Ruth wonders when it comes to Sienna and social media, what's really influencing her? To decode the reasons these apps are so powerful, let's work back from visual mediums parents of today grew up with. We've all had favorite TV shows or magazines, But is there something more intense about the impression social media leaves on everyone? To get at that difference, I asked Sarah Benet Weiser, a professor of communications with a 20-year career studying women's representation in media. She's also the director of the Annenberg Center for Collaborative Communication in California. You know, I can look through a magazine and look at images of women that are younger than me, thinner mm-hmm. than me, prettier than me, have better hair than I do. And, and, and it can make me feel less than, right? It can yeah. put that pressure on me to feel yes. um, insecure. That said, they don't say, Sarah, you should be thinner. Sarah, you should be prettier. Sarah, you should be younger, right? So one of the kind of aspects mm-hmm. of social media is that those pressures are felt much more personally, I think, mm-hmm. because it's directed towards the individual girl or young woman rather than to women or to femininity. I guess just first, in your work, you say that social media requires users to do a performance of self. Um, Can you describe what you mean by that? When we perform the self on social media, we are curating our own lives in very particular ways. And we're doing it for an audience. One of the things that I think was really interesting early on in the web was that girls were using blogging and uh, the internet much more than boys. And part of that, I think, is because there have been so few opportunities for girls to be in control of their own narrative. It's given to us by the media, by education, by parents, by culture. And so to be in control of your own narrative is exhilarating in lots of ways. But it also means then that you kind of engage in this performative mode all the time on social media. So you're constantly performing what you want yourself to be and you're doing it for an audience. So the lack of gatekeeping can be liberatory, but it can also mean that there's an added levels of pressures for especially girls and young women to perform a particular kind of feminine self. 
Is there any evidence that there's a facet, a particular facet of social media that seems to be the most influential on kids, like seeing their peers or the ability to be targeted with advertising? Is, is there something there that is most influential in your view? I mean, I think that all of those things are influential. One of the things that I find particularly troubling for young girls and, and women on social media is what you can do with a design app. When you can have Facetune and Photoshop and the hundreds of beauty apps that are really directed towards girls and young women that tell them this is how you can change yourself and this is what you will look like when you are better when you make that change. So there's this kind of constant drive to perfect oneself um, that comes with technology. And it's all sort of couched in this like progress rhetoric. Technology can solve your acne as well as, you know, going to space. To what degree do these pressures to perform affect teenage girls differently than boys? Can we make a distinction there? I often think about this in terms of performances of masculinity as authentic are often talked about as unfiltered and raw and tell it like it is. And for young women, performances of authenticity are about looking as perfect as they can without seeming fake. We now know that there are more female influencers than there are male influencers. Girls use Instagram more than boys do. One of the things that is you know, very problematic about that is the, it, the focus for girls is almost always on physical appearance. And so this idea that girls have to perform and curate a particular feminine self often has to do with the body or the face. Sarah's mention of how Instagram requires a feminine performance that has to do with the face takes me back to an article in The New Yorker in 2019, where writer Gia Tolentino introduced the concept of Instagram face. Right. I've really enjoyed seeing people's reactions to the idea of Instagram face because there's always an aha moment for people who use the app when they hear about this. Here's YouTuber Khadija Mbo talking about the first time she heard the term. So I clicked this, started reading the article, and I was just like freaking out because do y'all ever go through the gram and you're looking and you're like, why do all these people look the same? And you know what I'm talking about. They all literally have the same face, but just different skin tones. That's Instagram face. Yeah, I remember the article described Instagram face as a cyborgian look. <laughs> which is a powerful image. Yeah, it's a slim nose, it's big eyes, it's perfect, plump skin, and people use filters or other apps to get the look. And here's that word again, perfect. I want to know where this idea for the perfect face even came from. Did users decide? Did advertisers? Did the algorithm? Here's what Sarah said. Even within a kind of love your body discourse and everything else, there still is a really core hegemonic or, or mainstream understanding of what ideal femininity should look like. That's what those beauty apps are based on. When you are making your nose thinner and that's an option, there's a reason why that's an option, right? Having a thinner nose is seen to be more beautiful when you have bigger eyes and all the rest. So of course, those are built into the algorithm and they're built into the apps themselves so that you don't have a limitless number of options to choose from. And so I think we need to pay attention to the ways in which those boundaries of idealized beauty may seem to have been expanded, but really at their core, if you look, they're still generally white, thin, conventionally beautiful or attractive, long hair, blonde hair, you know, that kind of thing. Wow, so even without the old gatekeepers like magazine editors curating what we see, beauty ideals from other visual mediums have clearly found their way onto these new platforms. Yeah, and there was once a hope that the internet would solve issues like this. But as many researchers in this space say, Sarah included, the tech just isn't neutral. We didn't start with a blank slate, even when Instagram or TikTok were new platforms. They're built by people. And the beliefs those programmers hold are literally coded into the tech they built. 
this is working exactly as the way it is designed to work. You know, when you go online, the kinds of trappings that are about gender and race and class are built into the system. So in the last year, and in particular, in sort of response to the Facebook leaks, there's been a, a lot of discussion publicly about effects of technology on teenagers. How do you engage with that question? Is, is social media affecting my kid? How do you answer that? Yeah, well, it's hard. <laughs> but I do think that moral panics about social media are very unproductive for parents, for culture, for kids, and that we should actually engage in a conversation with kids and ask them what they're interested in and why are they interested in those things and kind of help them navigate. When Facebook's research on Instagram and mental health leaked, the headlines were largely about the negative effects they found, like the potential for addiction and making body image worse for one in three girls. But what made the research so newsworthy was the fact that it was internal research, something that many other big companies don't generally do, and something the public wouldn't normally see unless it was leaked in this kind of fashion. But it's still a limited set of studies from a single source. So to get more context for it, I reached out to Candace Odgers. She's a psychologist at UC Irvine in California, specializing in new technologies and how we can use them to understand and improve the lives of young people. Yeah, that's a great question is what do we actually know? Most people will endorse that social media is damaging to their mental health. And so that narrative is very strong. Now, the question is, does that map onto what we know about what any effects are? The most interesting thing throughout this whole thing has been the disconnect between what we believe and what we see in the data and across all kinds of data, whether that's massive self-reports of hundreds of thousands of adolescents, you know, whether that's intensive longitudinal studies, you know, following people on their phones, when we do that, we basically see no connection at the population level or really tiny associations that are explained by other things or that would be too small to have practical significance. What? That is not what I expected to hear. Hold on. There are some important caveats. Now, we are living through one of the fastest digital transformations in, in history, and there are real and rapid changes that are happening. So you combine those things together and it has the ingredients for parental panic. You know, I'm a parent too. We just, we worry a lot, right? But nothing is that simple, especially with a complex, you know, disease like depression. Another thing that you've argued is that when you do see a connection between social media use and mental health harms, it's largely due to pre-existing vulnerability to that harm to begin with. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and how we make that connection? Yeah, so everybody's drawing, and researchers included, are drawing the causal arrow from social media or digital media to mental health problems, right? But we've known for decades, right, that pre-existing mental health vulnerabilities influence the way we act the way we sleep, eat, activity, and especially our media consumption. And then with the Facebook leaks, we've really had this laser focus on adolescent girls, right? They're heavy users yeah. of social media. And it's also a group where we're seeing some increase, you know, earlier onset of depression, increase in suicide risk, those types of things. So that is an observable change in the mental health concern. Yeah, there is a, there is a change. It's actually interesting, though, we have to also guard against this female vulnerability narrative. And there's actually um, some great new research out of Canada, longitudinal research with young girls. And what they find there is that depression early on predicts the way that they engage with social media use later. But early social media use isn't predicting later depression. It's the mental health problems early on that are influencing how much social media use is used, what kind of social media is used versus the other way around. So this is a pretty relieving take on the Facebook research. Yeah, and there's been a big debate amongst researchers outside of Facebook about Facebook's findings and just how much we really know about mental illness and social media use. Why was there debate? Well, for one, the research wasn't peer reviewed like other academic studies would be. Hmm. That's because it was literally meant for internal use. It was corporate research. 
But many researchers also questioned the methods of these studies themselves. More broadly, I think the message here isn't that there's no connection between mental illness and social media. Research suggests that poor mental health changes the way people interact with social media. Right. So Candace is saying that people are likely struggling with their mental health before their negative experiences with social media and not necessarily because of social media use, unless something stressful is happening like online bullying. Exactly. Why do you think there's such a strong cultural narrative around the harm? I mean, say it's what we believe, but I think it's also what we feel. Um, we feel like it's doing harm. How do you explain that? It really is a dominant popular narrative right now. Yeah, there's actually a really interesting conversation to be had that adults are the ones with problems with social media and managing it. You know, younger generations are finding healthier ways. They're less likely to believe it, misinformation. They're finding different ways to kind of silo and cope. We're just so ready to have social media as the cause and depression as the effect. But in this work with young girls, it's showing us that these early mental health problems are really a leading indicator of how they might engage online. From your work, what do you see are some of the positive connections then? And how can we be using some of these particularly visual medias in ways that are beneficial for mental health? What we're arguing is for a more kind of a complex approach for this. Let's let's understand what's bringing kids online, what kinds of things they're seeking. So a number of studies have now shown that the vast majority of kids have actually gone online to seek out information or help for mental health problems. And so what are we doing with that information? We should be meeting them there with resources, with ways to connect them, with ways to educate, right? And so instead of just constantly asking the same old tired question, which is, can we measure number of hours online and then link that to depression or anxiety? Now, of course, there's still the bullying, the harassment, all the negative things that happen in those spaces. But I think this generation, they are difficult to study in big open platforms because they have so many private accounts, right? They're on Discord channels, they're on Finstas. So they're really siloing and curating their media experience in ways that, you know, perhaps our generation didn't develop the habits of doing. Now, some of those silos can be negative, right? And that's what we have to look out for in terms of vulnerable youth, people who might be susceptible to different types of messaging around mental health. A narrative we, we, we do hear a lot, particularly from kids, is just the degree to which they're coping. And they're incredibly resilient, incredibly creative. But should it be on them to figure this out? And it's not really fair that they should have to come up with all these immensely creative solutions to get rid of the toxic aspects of the system. That's the thing with parents, too. We offload so much of this on parents should just monitor their children's use, set up all the security systems so that their data is private. It's impossible. And so this is where platforms really need to step up. I am curious how you would advise parents to talk responsibly about this stuff to their kids, particularly that 12 or 13 age where they're beginning to want to get on these platforms. A lot of the anxiety is about not knowing what's in that platform, not knowing what your child is seeing or doing. You know, to the extent to which you can engage in the platforms with them, talk to them about what they're seeing. In the same way as we don't see what's happening at school or when they're off with their peers, you know, our window into that is communication. And it is tough, right, to get those tweens to talk. It so sure I get yeah. that. <laughs> So when you go to, you know, tell them to turn off the phone, you know, what are you shutting off? Are you shutting off an interaction with their friends, something that's social, or are they really zoning out and need to do something different too? So recognizing our own bias and uh, vulnerability to this narrative that social media is, is ruining our children. And some of it is just giving yourself a bit of a break as a parent too parents have been under a lot of stress, especially during the pandemic. So I think we could all give ourselves a little bit of a break on some of this. The science doesn't tell you how to parent your children, and it never does. But if parents are making decisions because they believe that the science says that social media is causing these things, 
then that's where I would full stop. That's not what we know right now. That's not where the data is pointing. And that's not where the majority of responsible people doing research either in depression or in, in social media are saying. So Taylor, back to Ruth's question about what's really influencing Sienna on social media. It's a tough one, but we've learned that the performative element of social media where people are not only looking at trends, but are really encouraged to act on them and then share that with their followers, that could be part of what makes social media so powerful compared to older versions of visual media where we're just passively taking things in. Plus, we've never been able to get feedback as fast as we're able to on social media. The likes, the comments, the new followers going viral, those elements really reinforce behavior too and encourage people to experiment with the trends that they see in these spaces. The other thing we really heard through these conversations is just how much anxiety parents themselves are feeling in not understanding these systems, in themselves feeling affected by these technologies as well. Um, yeah. And so the, projecting that on their on their children, that if it's hard for them as parents and they feel all this anxiety and these challenges, surely it must be for their kids as well. And so just so many intermixed emotions and feelings that are being projected from the parents, perhaps on kids who, who may have figured some of this stuff out um, better than their parents. Millie also reflected on the fact that no one really gives young people training on how to navigate these spaces either. And there can be a really steep learning curve for kids as they develop the ability to tell what's real and what's not, and more generally how they want to present themselves. The period where they're still figuring all of that stuff out seems like the period where extra support is really valuable. I think this gets to a central thing we've heard very clearly from a number of researchers in this space. And if it is the case that people who are predisposed to some of these really serious conditions are being made worse by these technologies, then we have to understand how these technologies are working, which gets to ultimately a point about how we study these problems more generally. One of the real challenges here is that studying human behavior and how it relates to the media we consume is a really difficult enterprise, and it always has been. And at the moment, there is a real disconnect between the people who want to study this connection and this issue and the people who have access to the data, which is the companies. Right now, most of the data and the research is being done by the very companies that control the technologies that we want to study. If we want to understand these things better, researchers simply need better access. And the optimist in me would like to point out that we are still learning how social media might be used to help as well. Oh, 100%. Millie and Sienna both said that social media does sometimes comfort them when they're feeling down. And so there's so much potential to enhance that part of it for teens. Sometimes when I'm sad, I just want to watch a funny video or like watch TikToks. I've met some of my closest friends through my social media platforms and they are some of the loveliest, most supportive people I'm lucky enough to know. And if I'd never started posting on Instagram or TikTok, I never would have met them. Another thing we've learned is social media's power to really shift beauty standards. Cyborgian faces are in vogue, for example. What Sarah shared about the ways that apps like Facetune may still be pushing us towards Eurocentric beauty standards really stuck with me. And for me, it's hard to reconcile things like that with the ways that I think social media has really democratized the establishment of beauty standards. You know, it gives young people from all backgrounds, body types, abilities, the list goes on, a chance to curate their media intake with people who they identify with and would probably see much less of if we only had TV and magazines to choose from. The fact that these apps and algorithms can undermine that is a huge issue because we know that representation has a powerful effect on the development of identity and confidence and self-esteem. Ruth and Sienna both told me that social media inspires Sienna to think outside the box when it comes to how she looks. I feel like people are normalizing girls not being so girly and like taking your own twist off of like street style. How about how perfectly you do makeup but you learned it all when oh. you were home? Yeah, I guess. But please don't think that I'm like a makeup artist because my mom sometimes likes to up-talk me. <laughs> While we put better researched approaches to this problem in place, Millie has tips for how to make your social media experience a happier one. You can put blocks on certain hashtags. So if there are certain topics that are particularly sensitive to you, 
you can literally block them on the app so you're not going to be exposed to that material. I think that's definitely a really good thing to do. Make sure that the community that you surround yourself in is a positive one that makes you feel good about yourself and not one that makes you feel like you need to change or be better or do things a certain way. Next episode, we'll be talking about another visual medium, YouTube. Many of our kids are watching it, and in many ways, it's watching them back. See you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Screen Time from TVO, Antica Productions, and the Center for Media, Technology, and Democracy at McGill University. I produced this show along with our senior producer, Kevin Sexton. Production assistance by Emily Morantz. Research support by Sonia Solomon, Cody Hauka, and Helen Hayes. Mixing and sound design by Phil Wilson and Mitchell Stewart. Our executive producer is Laura Regeer. Stuart Cox is the president of Antica. Katie O'Connor is the senior producer of podcasts at TVO. Lori Few is the executive producer for digital at TVO. I learned that being very strict was not going to work anymore. We needed to come up with something that was completely out of my comfort zone and also meet our needs and the new way that they navigate in the world.